Greetings Metalheads and welcome to the Friday 13th YouTube channel. Today you're going to be watching an interview with progressive power metal band LEG from Holland. These guys have wrote some fantastic albums in the 90s. I'd like to thank Ian Parry, vocalist, for doing this interview. Happy holidays, Ian. And I'd also like to say hello to the band. So please share Metalheads this interview on social media sites. It's in two parts, so part two will follow after part one. Stay safe, Metalheads. More interviews coming soon. Thanks for watching. Okay, so we're talking to Ian Parry from LG, everybody. So welcome to Friday 13th, Ian. Hi, man. Great to see you again Thank after you. all these years. So many years, my friend. So I'm going to ask you some warm-up questions first. Um, I don't think I've ever asked you this question. But as a performer, as a singer, who inspired you to become a singer? Which, which, Paul which, Rogers, uh... David Coverdale. Okay. Uh, definitely Paul Rogers, Dio. In the, in the old days, I played drums uh, with a student in a local village band when we folks moved from Liverpool to a place called Elton in Cheshire. And uh, there was this uh, local student and he was learning how to play guitar. And and, and uh, I told him, oh, yeah, my dad's got a couple of drum kits. He said, oh, let's uh, start a band together. He used to go round to his house. He had money. Uh, he was a student. Uh, he could buy uh, LPs at the time. And another friend of ours who was a bit older, he had a day job. So we used to go, I used to go with them listening to Fireball from uh, Deep Purple. And yeah, then when uh, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow came out, uh, I was blown away with Dio's voice. But I, it's, I love Dio, but I personally, uh, as a singer, I prefer Graham Bonnet. And I toured with him a few years back, which was an honor. Mm. Such a lovely man. But that was it for me in the old days. It was like I loved All Right Now, uh, Free, A Bad Company when it came out, uh, Free, Wishing Well, remember? Yeah. Wishing Well, Paul Rogers. I mean, what a fabulous voice. But I played drums for a year. All right, okay. And then uh, then uh, one day the uh, the singer couldn't make it and the guitar player said, okay, uh, have a go at singing, bring your brother down to the rehearsal room in the village hall and uh, you you do a bit of singing, let your brother play drums. I did that. And the next we had, next meeting we had was in a bush shelter in them days. <laughs> Under the rain. And he said, you're a singer, your brother's a drummer, and the singer's the second guitar player, <laughs> rhythm guitarist. That's how it went. All right, dude. But uh, later on, I got into people like uh, Steve Perry, Journey. I was blown away. When I worked with Zach Starkey back in the early 80s, 81, 82, we saw... Uh, a broadcast from Journey, uh, I think it was through the old Grey Whistle Test anyway. It was a live show on the BBC. Sat there with the band Mono Pacific with Zach and uh, he was like, this guy's great. <laughs> so that was like Steve Perry, but he had a phenomenal voice and, and clear and a high range. But I like more the, I went with more the rough edge, you know, the old school rough edge uh, uh, and then Coverdale, Coverdale was also, um, he's born on the same day as me, just by coincidence, 22nd of September. He also loved uh, Paul Rogers, also inspired by Rogers. And uh, when I saw the California Jam, with, uh, it went on video, it was from 1974, and it went on video from uh, Deep Purple. And I saw uh, Coverdale and Hughes, Glenn Hughes singing together. I was like, what the... <laughs> Amazing. So yeah, these are, that, that was basically my um, inspiration was the uh, new wave of British heavy rock or whatever it was called back in the old days. Yeah, I was going to say to you, was Glenn Hughes an influence you've just mentioned? Quite answered that yeah. question for me. Fantastic singer. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, oh, phenomenal. All right, Still then. to this day. So, so what was your first recorded band and signing band that you did? What would you do? What were you uh, doing? Well, the first recorded band band unsigned was Zach Starkey, Mono Pacific. It right. was called The Next, first of all, and then the British press went crazy because it was Ringo Starr's son, so we changed it to Mono Pacific, you know, like uh, One World, Peace, uh, that kind of thing, you know, a positive note. Yeah, And right. uh, all the demos, I didn't even realise all the demos we did in them days, you had like... Uh, Say we got one or two free days. It was it was in Titnes Park, Ringo's home, but I not realizing he bought this, the home from John Lennon. Not realizing he bought everything, including the microphone, the whole caboodle. 
So there I am doing the demo. He said, you've got an hour. So I had to sing 14 or 15 songs. Couldn't do it now. Probably kill me. But in them days, it was like, OK, <laughs> you just gave it your best shot. And uh, and I found I realized, found out later uh, when I saw uh, a video that came out of John Lennon recording songs for Imagine. Uh, I think it was uh, Milk and Honey, the album, or something like that. And there's the microphone, the same Neumann mic. Everything was the same. Kitchen table where we had a cup of tea. Took a breather and then carried on. And, uh, um, yeah, basically, uh, that's how it all started, uh, you know, back in 1981. We didn't have a deal. We got offered a contract. Twenty thousand pounds, A and M Records, to do the to, to record the full album again. We did a couple of video clips. One was filmed in Barnes, where the Beatles did some scenes for Hard Day's Night, just by coincidence. Engineer comes up and says, "Is that uh, is that the son from Ringo Starr?" Oh, he had his dad here a few years back doing uh, scenes for Hard Day's Night. You know, mate, Hard Day's Night, and. Uh, the we the it was a strange time, but we didn't get signed. Ringo wouldn't let his fifteen year old son at the time uh, enter into a contract, so everything just fell apart. All right. And so now about... uh, me, Zach, and the bass player Kerry Benford are the only three remaining band members. The other two sadly passed away, died of cancer. Yeah. So what was your first actual yeah. uh, album that you did rock metal? What was your first album that you did? The first <laughs> release was the Dutch band Hammerhead, a 12-inch, uh, I think it was a three or four-track EP, Hammerhead, right. Heart Made of one. Steel. Don't know that one. Yeah, uh, and it was before then, uh, before we got Joe Franco in, I, I went on national radio in the Netherlands. That was in 1983. And uh, we did the recordings with EMI Holland at their studios. We, we, Oh, yeah, we went over. They sent us over to EMI Germany. We did a show in the Milky Way, the Melikweg in yeah, Amsterdam. One, yeah, I remember that. I've, I've been there. <clears throat> yeah, and the uh, Germans from EMI Germany, EMI Electrola, came over. That was in 84. They saw the show straight away. They just took us over from Holland. And then we got David Rosenthal from Rainbow, the keyboard player, to play and produce us. And we got Joe Franco, a, a good buddy of his. He was from Twisted Sister, Widowmaker. I think he's just, he did the farewell tour recently, I think last year with Dee Snyder, but Joe's retired now. <laughs> I wanted him on my last Rock Emporium Brute Force album, but he'd retired, sadly. But uh, that's that. That was kind of how it all went for me. Uh, you know, the ball really started rolling in the Netherlands. Right. So, what did you uh, do after that? I was, was partnering around years ago uh, <clears throat> in London, uh, doing um, uh, these presentations for record companies, and I had Jem Davis. He was in a band called Tobruk playing. I remember with me. those guys? I saw them with UFO many years ago. <clears throat> yeah, years ago. I think he he works with Shy now, or no, the other you. Great UK band with an incredible singer. Uh, oh, what are they? I can't remember the name. Doesn't at the tip of my tongue. But anyway, uh, we did all these um, presentations for all these major labels. They're full of bollocks. You know, I got stuff. I ended up signing with EMI anyway with Hammerhead, and it came out. The great thing for me was it was on the EMI Harvest label, same as Deep Purple. So that was a real kick for me. But they, they, it went over budget. The Hammett album, the uh, the EP came out, but the album was shelved. Wow, they shelved it. It was a big ruckus going on between EMI America. We flew to London. Uh, a guy called Heinz Hen was setting up. Uh, he was from Capitol Records. He was setting up EMI America. David Bowie was the first, or Bowie, he was the first uh, pop release, and Hammerhead was going to be the first rock band they were going to release. But EMI Germany, Electrola and EMI uh, Capital, uh, EMI America had a big ruckus. So they shelved it, put the whole thing on ice for years. And it didn't, that was in 1985. And it didn't come out Hammerhead until under a short license deal from a Dutch label. He got permission from EMI. But actually, not wanting to spill the beans or cause a ruckus myself, some. 35 years later but EMI actually uh, 
didn't fulfill their agreement in the contract. But we didn't have a pot to piss in, excuse my French, so we couldn't take him to court. I didn't want to, uh, right. to be honest. Okay. Uh, and that really, we, we were all set up. We went to meet the Scorpions. We were all set up with Hammerhead to go on tour worldwide with the Scorpions. That was in 1985. Same manager as the Scorpions, Tina Turner. She was coming back, uh, all British songwriters. They were doing a big push for Queen the Works at the time. I got a test pressing from Queen the Works. I'm an idiot. I gave it away to a friend of mine 35 years ago. What a fool. <laughs> and uh, But I do things like that. I'm always giving my shit away. Excuse my French. But, um, you know, I like giving people stuff. But sometimes it's good to, if you keep your own memorabilia. <laughs> Absolutely. So when you look back in at the previous Elegy albums, just moving on, before you joined the band, which which is your yeah. favourite album that, that you... Lost. Right, Lost. Is, there, is there a reason why? <clears throat> yeah, I just loved Spirits. It blew me away. And when I finally uh, figured out how to sing the song, because it's a ball stretcher, uh, I never looked back. And then we did the... Um, we started with the Acoustic Primal Instinct album. So we did uh, six uh, acoustic tracks. And I did a kind of slightly blues, rocky approach, changed things a little bit. Because when Edward, uh, Edward, Edward, when he f recorded these songs, and I uh, only have total respect for him, invited him on for Forbidden Fruit to sing with us. Uh, met him recently at the Jeff Tate Headless show backstage. Even asked him if he would do the reunion with us, but it, for him, it's it's in the past now. But when Edward did, did these songs, he was like a kid. You know, he had this like voice which was up, uh, on the brink, on the cusp of splitting over to a full voice, but he still had this like height that you get almost before your voice breaks, you know? Yeah. So he's up there like he's got ten testicles or something. <laughs> or one, whichever he, way. He always yeah. he always Ian, he always reminded me of Tony Arnell from TNT. Yeah. Very high. Yeah. Very similar That's style. It, incredibly high. Yeah. Yeah. So um and I'm doing now doing a similar technique he used. Um also, what uh, the singer of Dream Theater uses, Labrie. Yeah. So that you can switch over to falsetto, but it's still with force, with power. And that's what I'm doing with uh, the Elegy songs now live. I mean, don't forget, Edward was 1918 and I'm 63. But funny enough, the falsetto is still uh, that there. Uh, that shit's still there. I can still do that. I don't know why, but I can still do that. Do you train your so that's what I'm doing now to get with uh, the Elegy songs. Um, and I'm using that approach to do all the old numbers. But Lost, I mean, I, I love Supremacy, Labyrinth of Dream. I love them all, uh, mm. the earlier albums. Um, And there was, um, I would say there was a magic... Um, Hank, what we've decided to do now, and that's the first thing I said to Hank, when we start working on new songs, which we will, I don't want to have really too much influence on the musical side of the songwriting. I'll do the lyrics and vocal melodies like I always do, because then I can, when I'm doing my old vocal melodies, I can perform the songs better. It's a fact most singers can. So I'll do the lyrics, vocal melodies, but... Spoke to Gilbert because Gilbert Pot had never worked with him before. He's back in. He's yeah. a he's a lovely man. You'd love him to bits. You maybe you've met him. I don't know. No, I haven't. I've I've met Hank yeah. when he was drunk at yeah. the, uh, the Big Ben Club in Eindhoven when I met him. <laughs> oh yeah, weren't we all? <laughs> but thank God we're taking it serious these days. Well, we did, but we used to like having a beer together. Why not? But um, anyway, I just said to uh, Hank and uh, Gilbert. Look, um, what would be great if they just spend some time together? This, they've still got stacks of ideas lying there that they never finished off. So that's what they're going to do. They're going to work on the music. Then uh, Gilbert comes over here. We set it in Pro Tools. And then I uh, I record everything at home. I have my uh, cool C414 AKG mic. 
And the great thing is, is I can come in, I call it my screaming room and I can come in and out whenever I like and just scream my nuts off. And that's what I do. And it it's for me, it's a luxury these days that I do that. You know, right. all the traveling we used to do, all the money we spent on going up and down, going up and down to Germany, you know, loads of money went out the door. I don't have to do that anymore if it's middle of winter outside because we're in Christmas. Uh, as soon as the snow comes, I don't have to go anywhere. I'm here all nice and warm, get all hot and bothered, and I do the business. Yeah. I mean, you've pretty much got the the, the cult classic lineup, haven't you? Obviously, yourself being the I think that replaced Edward, but it's pretty much the cult classic lineup for you that reformed. I mean, you back in the day, you you did that tour with Stratovarius and Camelot. I think I think it'd be great for you guys to do a reunion with Camelot. Yeah, that would be cool. That would be cool. I mean, it's stupid. It's sad also that Elegy didn't carry on like Camelot did. Because Elegy was basically at the point we used to switch between some countries like Italy, we'd headline another country, another country, uh, Camelot would headline. And we were basically on the same level. We became very close friends because I went over to America with Derek. I've been there several times doing stuff with a project I started called Consortium Project. Yeah, I've got the so albums. Been, <laughs> we were friends for years and we were on the same kind of level about to break because Elegy was like going massive at one point. I mean, we were selling into the hundreds of thousands of albums, you know, uh, it was ridiculous. And, uh, but unfortunately, he had, Hank, he left the band and that was it. It just kind of, I, I'd worked with Patrick Rondat in consortium. So I said, I can ask uh, if Patrick wants to help us out, which he did. And then he joined. But for everybody, if the fans, Pat, Patrick is in his own right a superb high class guitar player from uh, Jean Michel Jarre. Incredible. But Heng has a unique sound and style and songwriting style. And together with Gilbert, that is the ultimate combination. And we've got that back, for, uh, like what they did in Lost, my, my favorite album. And uh, we've got that back. You know, and, and that's the thing. It would have been cool to, to have done the live reunion with Gil, with um, Edward, Edward, but he didn't want to do it. Okay, at least we asked him for the fans. And uh, so, in my opinion, once they start um, going, because we spent a lot of time, months, getting the set right, um, working out all the... Getting that rapport back from... Uh, what was it the last time we played together with Hank? I think was in, oh, uh, 98. And the last thing I ever did with Hank was the uh, we went to Japan on a promo tour with a, acoustic uh, sessions. We did live cable TV and recorded in JPC studio, played at Hard Rock Cafe, a bit too early in the morning. <laughs> and uh, we did all these things again. It was amazing. And we found out that the old uh, management record company stole all the publishing money and he, he basically hadn't been paying the band anything. And he's a bastard. Uh, and his character is a bit like uh, uh, his record company name is, is a real shark. And there are sharks in this music business, I can tell you. And I've seen evidence to prove. I was given evidence from here, my music publishing, that they paid him in the hundreds of thousands, this guy. And that was it. That killed it for Hank. He just went downhill after that. And that's, that's what it. killed it for everybody. That's a shame. So, uh, and that's the that's that's the sad <clears throat> thing sometimes in the music business. I've always said I'm gonna protect myself. I learned, I let I taught how to negotiate uh, contracts myself. I wanted to know all the legal jargon after the hammerhead thing. I had that experience, bad experience, sadly, with hammerhead. All my dreams went down the toilet. Uh and I was only uh what was I, uh, 24, 24, 25 years old or something. Anyway, I had that experience at a young age, at a young age, and I promised myself I wouldn't let these sods uh, do it to me again. Um, and now, that that's the thing now, no more nonsense anymore in the music business. It's now time that the artists uh, start earning money instead of everybody else. 
And, and it isn't easy, I can assure you, to earn money. And to earn a little bit of money, you need millions of streams. Streams bring in peanuts. You get just a little bit less than one cent per stream. How are you gonna how are you gonna pay your bills on that? Yeah, I know. So I know. what we're doing now, we're ju- we're doing it also because for the love of Elegy's music. I mean, I still personally believe as a Brit that this Dutch band uh is a pearl and it was and it never um it was never really shown to the world like it should have been. And that's what I hope now that we can do that with Elegy. And and already we've been playing for the fans in Italy and, and they came and they were there from 30 odd years back. And there they were, you know, and uh, it was great. It was like being with your family. It was strange, but also fabulous at the same time. So when you so, look back, uh, I honestly believe now that Elegy will get the opportunity. We're playing in Pro Power Festival uh, in September in Atlanta. I believe it's the second day. It's already sold out. Pro Power. It's the second day sold out really quick. So uh, I think now this may be, you know, some people say, uh, uh, like the, the Stones came back with, Rolling Stones came back with a great tune. I love it. You know, old rockers never die. True. I've never been a big fan of his voice, but that's a different thing. But yeah. uh, it just shows you can do it. But with our music, with progressive heavy metal, it's a completely different vocal show. <laughs> I'm, I don't even know if Mick Jagger's got a falsetto. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, the thing is, we're going to give it a best shot, and the fans are thrilled to bits. That's brilliant. And uh, already great reviews from the couple of live shows we did. Also, Dynamo we played on the 5th of November. And uh, that was great for Holland after more than 25 years with Henk. And uh, all the fans were, you know, uh, singing and clapping. Henky, Henk. We had fans came over from Japan, from all over Europe. It was unbelievable. Never yeah, expected it. I wanted to make the Eindhoven gig, but I just couldn't get a ferry. It was, it was just, I'd love to have seen that show. Yeah, no, I, I know how it goes. I've just been there from Hook of Holland, Harwich with the ferry. Uh, I had to go uh, with an emergency, but a uh, family member. But uh, I know how it is. And uh, also, uh, if the weather's nasty, it's not very nice. Flights uh pretty tough these days uh, as well. So yeah. when you look back at the uh, the albums that you have done with Elegy, which one's your favourite, Ian? Uh, well, I guess um, for the success that we achieved and also the melodic side of it has to be State of Mind. Uh, I mean, the pre-sales in Japan before it even came out were 14,000. We went on to sell over 25,000 copies. It's more now, I believe, in Japan. And uh, I think that album did in Italy. I mean, I've never known a record company to have to repress and repress and repress like Modern Music Noise Records, uh, TNT did. Yeah. Um, And the fans, when we were in Japan... uh, even the Japanese fans were singing Shadow Dancer, the lyrics, which took me by surprise. When we arrived in, um, same thing happened in uh, Greece, in Thessalonica. We'd never been there before, Thessaloniki. We'd never been there before. And um, I lost where I was going in the in the lyrics because they started singing the songs and they knew all the words. And it really took me by surprise. <laughs> and I was like, what the <laughs> You know, and uh, all these great things, sold out shows. Uh, you know, that was with Stratovarius, the Stratovarius tour with Elegy. Uh, and um, uh, so it's it's got to be state of mind for the melodic side and the uh, the catchy songs. If if you like, you could almost you could say, uh, it was a commercial prog rock album, but for the power. And the intensity and the top class production and the quality of songwriting, more mature, if you like, was the concept album, Manifestation of Fear. And not a lot of people realize it was a concept album. It was based on uh, Hank was telling me a story about his, he never uh, had a chance to um, 
uh, meet his dad. He never knew who his father was. His dad sadly passed away at a very uh, young age. And that took that took me by surprise. And um, I planted a seed in my mind, a creative seed. And my mum and dad basically didn't get permission to marry back in the old days in Liverpool. So it was a kind of a Gretna Green eloping to Scotland type of thing to get married. They basically got married without the consent of the, both sides of their parents. And that was just after the Second World War in the uh, late uh, 40s. Um, so I used that concept of an industrial city like Liverpool because my dad was struggling like hell, couldn't find work. One time he didn't, he, he he couldn't find work, didn't wasn't able to bring uh, food home to put food on the table. And thank God, my mum's mother, who had a job in Liverpool, she uh, she went out and bought some shopping, and my mum could cook for all of us, including my dad. He came home sad as hell, and there was a hot meal on the table waiting for him. So that environment, and also with Hank not knowing his father and the frustration, I I used that as the basis for the concept story, manifestation of fear. That's why you see the industrial city, you know, yeah. growing up in Liverpool. Yeah, uh, that was the influence, but it but it wasn't anything to do with negativity. It was just sometimes people have these experience experiences as it's a fact of life, and in Japan. The sales went like this because they thought it was elegy going in the the demon zone because it's called manifestation of fear, lost in translation, but it had absolutely nothing. It was just about growing up in a working class environment. Right. You know, and losing your loved ones and not knowing loved ones. That's what it was about.